Welcome to the news update on day 326 of the war in Ukraine, brought to you by The Account. Thank you for tuning in once again. Today we will take a look at the aftermath of the Russian missile attack on Ukraine before we go over the minor news grouped into the situation inside Ukraine, the occupied territories, Russia and Belarus, and the international developments. But to start, the flashpoints along the front. Kremina. Russian shelling was reported in the urban outskirts by the general staff of Ukraine. Either Russia targeted Ukrainian positions or, the most likely scenario, shelled its own troops, which has happened several times so far. Since Ukraine requested a media blackout and a lot of misleading information is being spread everywhere currently, it is impossible to make any good assessment. However, depending on how the situation develops, we could see Russia falling back to the Krasna River for better defensive positions, marked here. Seri Heide, head of the Luhansk Oblast Military Administration, reports that Ukrainian forces are slowly moving forward around Kremina. Solidar. Russia reportedly captured salt mine number 7, which we saw yesterday in a video with a Ukrainian flag mounted on one of the buildings. At best, Ukraine is now holding on to only a very small part of the outskirts on the other side of the train tracks marked here. No information about the battles for the Solidar settlement of Sila are available. The spokesperson for the eastern grouping of the armed forces of Ukraine, Serhi Cherevati, said fighting in Solidar is ongoing with 32 clashes and 119 Russian soldiers killed over the past 24 hours. According to him, Russian forces have to climb over the bodies of their fallen comrades to advance. Bakhmut Russia continues to attack Bakhmut and the surrounding settlements. Oputne is currently stalled. In the east, Ukraine seems to have made some gains towards the Champagne factory, but this is not confirmed. South of Bakhmut, Russia continues to try and storm Klischivka without much success. And to start the new segment, the latest reports on the aftermath of the Russian missile attack on Ukraine yesterday. During the Russian missile attack yesterday, 50 houses, 3 schools, 2 kindergartens and an administrative building were damaged in the city of Kriviri. Due to damage to critical infrastructure, electrical generation in Ukraine has decreased drastically. Seri Kovalenko, CEO of Ukrainian energy supplier Yasno, warned that Ukrainians will have to prepare for long-term blackouts. The situation is dire enough for Ukrainergo to significantly limit consumption throughout Ukraine and in Kyiv particular. A three-day mourning period has been announced in the city of Dnipro, where an apartment building was destroyed during the Russian missile attack. So far, it is known that 75 civilians were injured and rescuers have recovered the bodies of 30 victims killed in the attack. Currently, they are still looking for 30 to 40 missing people. One woman was lucky to survive. She spent 10 hours trapped under the rubble after rescue workers could hear her muffled calls for help during a minute of silence and managed to pull her out. Sadly, according to the mayor of the city, chances to find additional survivors are very slim. According to the Prosecutor General's office, the only unit in Russia with the capability to launch the KH-22 missile, which is suspected of hitting the building, is the 52nd Guards Heavy Bomber Aviation Regiment. And now for the latest updates out of Ukraine. The Ukrainian Ministry of Defense has reiterated that sharing information about movement or location of the armed forces of Ukraine, which has not been officially released by the general staff or other authorized sources, is a crime. This might be related to an article by CNN in which journalists reported online that they allegedly saw an organized withdrawal of the armed forces of Ukraine from Solidar. Russia is preparing an information campaign against Ukraine, which may involve Ukrainian journalists, the main intelligence directorate of the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine has warned. According to the warning, Russia will launch a comprehensive fake news campaign in the near future, aimed at undermining trust in Ukraine on the part of its Western partners. The goal is to reduce any aid sent by foreign partners, as well as gather information on the state of the Ukrainian army. Moving on to the latest out of the occupied territories. According to Yevhen Yerin, a spokesperson for the Southern Command of Ukrainian Forces, Russia has begun preparations to repel any Ukrainian offensives in the south. 
Parts of the front line have seen an increase in deployed personnel and Russia has begun trying to conscript locals. The mayor of Melitopol, Ivan Fedorov, stated that Russian occupiers have not let a single civilian leave the occupied areas for Saporizhia in the past week. Meanwhile, Russia has intensified filtration measures at checkpoints. To enter Crimea, for example, fingerprints and DNA samples are collected. Now for the news updates from Russia and Belarus. In Belgorod Oblast, a senior sergeant detonated an anti-personnel fragmentation grenade on the premises of a military base. The explosion caused a large-scale fire which led to the detonation of an ammunition storage facility. Three soldiers were killed, 16 injured and eight are still missing. Russia has expanded its active fleet in the Black Sea to 16 warships, six of them missile carriers with approximately 40 caliber missiles. And to wrap up the news segment, the international developments. The government of the United Kingdom has confirmed plans to provide Ukraine with a squadron of 14 Challenger 2 tanks and about 30 155mm AS-90 self-propelled artillery systems. UK defense and security officials believe that a window has opened in which Russia is retreating due to supply problems and plummeting morale and urged allies to deploy their support as well. Rheinmetall, Germany's leading defense manufacturer, currently has 22 Leopard 2 and 88 Leopard 1 in storage facilities. However, should the government give the OK to send tanks to Ukraine, the company would need about a year to prepare the tanks and therefore not be able to supply them before 2024. According to the President of Finland, the best option to end the war would be one that is fair for Ukraine and would not cause Russia to seek revenge. He further added that he still worries that Putin will go all the way without a chance of victory. According to CNN, Ukrainian ingenuity in using Western weapons on the battlefield has impressed US officials and they study Ukraine's example of how it can be applied in modern warfare. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg stated that Ukraine can expect the deliveries of additional heavy arms from Western partners in the near future. We are in a crucial phase of the war, he said. It is therefore important that we provide Ukraine with the weapons it needs to win. He also praised the recent decision from the US, France and Germany to supply infantry fighting vehicles and light tanks to Ukraine. Roderich Kiesewetter, a member of the Christian Democratic Union of Germany in the Bundestag, suggested Germany could buy back Gepard anti-aircraft systems from Qatar and provide them to Ukraine. The Gepard tanks are no longer needed there. They are in working conditions, so I think it would be good to buy them back. We should do everything that can contribute to the victory of Ukraine, he stated. And now for the daily intelligence reports, starting as usual with the UK Ministry of Defence. On January 12, 2023, Andrei Katapolov, the head of the Russian State Duma Defense Committee, suggested Russia would extend the upper age of routine military conscription from 27 to 30 in time for the spring 2023 draft. Katapolov said the move would be intended to enable the previously announced 30% increase in the size of Russia's forces. Last year, President Putin said he supported such a move, and Russian officials are likely sounding out public reactions. There is a realistic possibility that Russian leaders hope a change of age criteria for routine conscription could bolster personnel available to fight in Ukraine, while appear less alarming to the population than announcing another round of the unpopular partial mobilization process. Moving on to today's assessment by the Institute for the Study of War. The researchers write that Yevgeny Prigozhin, head of the Wagner PMC, is most likely trying to use Solidar in order to discredit the Russian military while promoting his own mercenaries. According to Prigozhin, the Wagner Group succeeded because it has superior experience, equipment and management systems compared to the Russian military. This is likely an attempt to advertise the mercenary company for further recruitment. Footage published on January 14th showed Prigozhin in the town of Solidar promoting Wagner's role in capturing the town. The researchers further examined the latest statements made yesterday by Vasily Nebenzia, Russian diplomat and permanent representative to the United Nations. 
Responding to Ukrainian proposals for a peace summit, Nebenzia once again used the Kremlin's propaganda that Ukraine was about to attack Moscow and Russia had to act first. Nebenzia further suggested Ukraine is nothing more than a paramilitary organization under NATO and has no interest in negotiating, while Russia has stated continuously they are ready for talks on their terms. According to him, Ukraine's refusal to accept the annexation of its territories and its relationship with the West continues to threaten Russia. Nevenzia also went over the usual claims of discrimination against Russian speakers in Ukraine, which are a long-standing information operation seeking to justify Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The Institute argues this shows Russia has not abandoned its maximalistic goals in Ukraine and will use this continued narrative to try and coerce the West to negotiate over Ukraine's head. And to wrap up the report, the evening update by the General Staff of Ukraine. The enemy does not abandon its intention to capture the entire Donetsk region. The enemy conducts offensive actions in the Bakhmut and Avdivka directions and tries to improve the tactical position in the Kupiansk and Liman directions. In the Novo Pavlivka, Saprizhia and Herson directions, the enemy is defending. The enemy continues to suffer significant losses. Thus, due to the lack of beds in the hospitals of Holivka settlement of Donetsk region, all wounded from the front line in the Donetsk direction are evacuated to Stanivka. And that concludes today's report. If you're interested in any of the articles I mentioned, as always, the links are in the description. Thank you for tuning in and have a great day. You were listening to The Account. Slava Ukraini.